my sons are, uh, my two sons <laughs> are editors and special effects guys. And they told me that this better have a Hollywood ending or uh, I should stay home. So I'll let you decide. <laughs> but uh, we've been at this for a long time. So to hear what you're gonna hear today. And I know this topic is a problem for a lot of people. It's touched us for so long. I promised I wasn't gonna do this. And uh, so I think I've been at this for 30 years and I think I can bring a different conclusion to this whole thing. What I'd like to do is bring on a journey from where I was trained in the 70s, which were some of you weren't even born yet, so back to where I am today. And back in the 70s, uh, it was very aggressive surgery for breast cancer. We were gonna teach that cancer a lesson. The bigger the tumor, the bigger the knife we got out. Mm, cool. And, uh, and, and, that, and, that, and, the, and the, the surgery took two hours. We had two assistants with big retractors. And patients spent days in the hospital trying to just move her arm again. Okay? That's how I was trained. We obliterated women unnecessarily, as it turns out, but it took a long time to come to the conclusion that you don't have to do it if you just don't follow the recipe everybody follows. So uh, from there, I treat now with the FDA approved, uh, it's called Sonaris Physica 2 system, uses liquid nitrogen. It's about minus 300 degrees, so it's pretty cold. If you stick your finger in it and flick it, it'll fall off. So I have to be really careful. <laughs> because I'm dealing with a breast, you know, come on guys, <laughs> you know. And uh, so, uh, procedure lasts about 20 minutes. They resume normal activity. And um, I haven't even put a stitch in. And it's so good that I, at this point in time, I invite members of the family in <laughs> to hold the patient's hand. Can you believe that? Uh, you know, so, I, in fact, <laughs> one of the patients, her husband was a lawyer. So I invited him in, and that was probably the first time an attorney had ever watched something like this, or any doctor invited an attorney into a procedure. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really that good. I knew I was walking on hallowed ground when I, when I, uh, when I uh, did my first cases. Uh, in fact, one of my patients, the first time we did this, uh, immediately after the procedure, she said she felt so hungry, she wanted to go across the street. So uh, we all went across the street to Lavender Bistro in La Quinta. <laughs> it's a high-end restaurant. And when in 15 minutes, she was eating lobster salad and we toasted killing her cancer with a glass of Chardonnay, okay? So, yeah. So, uh, two year, over two years later, when I just looked at her mammogram, no cancer on it, okay, it was clear as a bell. I pumped my fist and I wiped the tear like I'm doing now, because uh, I, knew, I knew I had an answer to a problem that has plagued us since recorded medical history. 2300 BC, the Edwin Smith papyrus, you can look it up. They didn't know how to treat breast cancer then. They said they didn't know what to do. They just threw their hands up. So my wife actually came up with, uh, with the name. She says, do you realize what happened? We should just call this the Lavender Way. I said, okay. So that's what it is. Uh, the Lavender Way encompasses uh, three things. Pharmacogenomics, multiple modalities without radiation. Use mammography too. I don't want to unplug mammography machines. It's a really good, great tool. Been with us for a long time. Uh, and then the treatment. And it's all done under the umbrella of what I call sanctuary centers, where we take breast cancer doctors uh, out of behind a metaphorical wall at these cancer centers because you don't get to see these guys. These guys spend a lot of time getting educated and know a lot about breast cancer, 
but they don't have any interaction with you until you come in with a lump and they try and put you back together again. So I figured, huh, let's look, let's get these guys out from behind the wall and into making a relationship with these girls early on so that the idea is maybe a 20-something or a 30-something year old when she wants to know, no pressure, she comes in, we do the genetic testing. This isn't BRCA1 and 2. That's only good for 10% of the population. So we have the capability now in every girl, not to just know her risk, but when that risk will likely manifest within about 10 years during her lifetime. That is like having a crystal ball for me, finally, through all these years. Yeah, sorry. And uh, if you've seen the devastation like I had, I had a girl die in my arms, for God's sake, back in the hospital 20 years ago. And before she died, I told her that I, I would not relent until I had an answer. Excuse me. This gets really tough for me. Uh, yeah. Because GPs, dermatologists, don't deal with this stuff. And it's really difficult when you can't do any more for a patient. But now I can. So there it is. Uh, so it's an umbrella of nurturing environment for these women. And there's no pressure. And we, we do this years before she's going to ever encounter breast cancer. And the idea is to prevent it altogether. And the, also the idea is that if we get this right now, we have the technology where I can zero in on these cancers when they're about four millimeters. That's about the size of a kernel of uh, corn, okay? And at that size, virtually none of those. Don't say none, because it's cancer and it does what it does. But even if a cancer has potential to be very aggressive later on, probably isn't when it's this big, okay? The average size tumor is over a centimeter in size that has a billion cancer cells in it and probably has metastatic disease already, cancer that's spread. So the idea is to get it before we do that. And then I was trained in the 70s to get it all, and guess what? It didn't work, did it? Because otherwise, 40,000 women wouldn't be dying every year, okay? Um, and, and that's a, a problem. And then, um, so if we get, if we know when the cancer's coming, we can plan out for her a lifelong personalized surveillance program. And as the time approaches where that cancer is gonna, we think it's coming, we can just go ahead and accelerate the imaging. So we find these little tiny cancers, okay? Ultra small cancers, I call them. So I use three, uh, I use three modalities. I use modified military infrared. This isn't your father's th thermography from the 70s that everybody says doesn't work. This works plenty good, otherwise the military wouldn't be using it. So Bush declassified this, and it not only has, uh, it just detects heat signatures in, in the breast, and there's no, there's, no, uh, there's no compression girl, so there's not like mammography. And uh, it also has um, artificial intelligence. So it has the capability, once it knows your heat signatures, it runs it by, just instantaneously, by 500 girls that are in the computer that have um, uh, abnormal infrared heat signature and um, uh, uh, breast cancer. So it'll tell me right away, basically. So it can really, it's really differentiated between benign and malignant disease for me. And in some cases, it's, it's actually one of the drawbacks with this stuff. We're working on refining it, but one of the drawbacks is <laughs> it'll tell me there's a cancer there and mammography and MRI doesn't pick it up and then three years later, bingo, there it is. So we're working on that, trust me. I'm working on this like a hawk because um, I want this, what if we could get it when it's a millimeter, okay? Then it wouldn't really finish chemotherapy. Not that I have anything against it if it needs it, okay? Um, so uh, so that's, that's really where it's at and I, you know, I think I have an answer to this thing, um, a workable answer, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. Um, and um, we've got a problem though. We've depended on the same 
system for the past 30 years, okay? And that is, we've told women, we've sold mammography probably better than anything else on the planet. Just go get a mammogram every year, do self-breast exam, and run a race, and everything's gonna be okay. And it just isn't, is it? Uh, we still have the same 200,000 cases every year and the 40,000 deaths for as long as I can remember. And if the National Cancer Institute is right, they wrote a paper, published it last year, by 2030, we're going to have double the number of breast cancer cases in this country. So that'll be 400,000. And if we do the same old, same old, it'll be 80,000 deaths. So if we're not prepared to do that, then what I'm calling for is this country has to decide how it's going to treat women for the next 20 years. What do women mean to us? Are we going to change our attitude and, and see what's out there, or are we just going to do wait for the next drug that extends life for three months? Come on. Uh, no, this really works. And uh, I knew I was walking on hallowed ground. The light went off for me when I comboed all these technologies. So I have the infrared right in the office there. Right next to it is my exam table. Next to that is my uh, ultrasound unit with elastography, which tells me whether something's hard or soft. And we have Doppler flow. And right next to that is a view box so I can look at the mammogram. So I have that capability to put all these together right at every visit if I need to use them, and we do. Um, and so we find these little tiny cancers. And it makes a big difference, because then we can do lavender. Okay, and just for everybody, if there's any doctors in the audience, they're saying, oh, you can't do that for everybody because cancer is widespread. Okay, so we're gonna do genetic studies on the tumor, and it, yeah, so it, it's a four millimeter tumor and it's aggressive, so you still wanna do sentinel lymph node biopsy or axillary node surgery, you can do that. You can still do chemotherapy, but just leave the breast alone because it doesn't make any difference. It's never been shown to be better than lumpectomy. We've spent $300 billion since Nixon penned the National Cancer Act in 1971. And part of that money went to multiple clinical trials that proved lumpectomy was just as good as mastectomy. And now we have a movement in this country called oncoplastic surgery. So the surgeons are gearing up for more radical surgery. American College of Surgeons in the paper came out last month, 2000, January 2016. And the title, was, was, the title was Bilateral Mastectomy, Driven by Fear or Prevention. And one of the writers said, we are facing a tsunami of requests for mastectomy. I can only say that you know, this is wrong. This is really not good. Is this the answer we have for women after $300 billion and 40 years of research that we're gonna take both breasts off? Why don't we just do it at puberty and then we'll rid ourselves of the whole damn problem? Guys wouldn't like that though, no. So, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so um, it's one of the foundations of our country for God's sake. So no, we wanna do this a different way. And so we need people to, uh, to you know, embrace this, okay? To look around other, rather than just looking for the next drug. So when I do this procedure, it's outpatient procedure, do it under local anesthesia. And as I said, uh, you know, they resume normal activity uh, right away. And a um, couple of things I've mentioned, as the, we kill the cancer, uh, and, and uh, uh, about two months after we do core biopsies on all these patients, because I want to make sure I kill the cancer. So we really don't lose anything. You can, look, my, you know, you can always take the breast off if you have to. You can't put it back on. So by doing the lavender, I kill it in 20 minutes with the Sonaris Visica 2 system, and it's dead. And we biopsy it, and it's dead. It comes, the pathology reports come back, fat necrosis and infarction. And I almost fell off, because I, I blinded the pathologist. I didn't tell him what I was doing. I didn't tell him I, what I was doing, and I wanted to see what, he, what they would say. And that's what they said, and that's what they all say. Okay, um, and so, uh, so as the dead cancer cells are absorbed in the body, because we don't operate on the patient, that acts like a dead polio virus. So the patient's own immune system is producing 
specific antibodies against her specific tumor. That's preliminary data. So, you know, it'll take 15 years to, to decide, you know, if this is going to make a difference in terms of recurrences or survival, okay? So, but that can't hurt, <laughs> I don't think. And then we also solved the age-old problem of positive margins. Um, in that same uh, American College of Surgeons article, uh, they said that uh, the take back for a second lumpectomy because, oh, there was cancer at the six o'clock margin and then the, radi and the radiation therapist doesn't want to do radiation because there's, there's cancer there, you have to go back and get it. Okay, so we go back and get it. 40% of the time is the average, okay? And they had a 30% complication rate in young women, in 30-year-olds, 30% 30 complication, and in, and in 70 year olds, the complication rate was 75%. Come on, where are these people? I mean, come on, we, we gotta do this better for the girls, don't we?